This week, we photographed the Northern Lights in Iceland. Welcome to episode number one of Around the World with Taylor Jackson, presented by Nikon. feels like I've known Iceland my entire life, but it's really only been about 10 years. As a kid, I remember seeing Iceland on a map and thinking that it was this big iceberg floating in the middle of the Atlantic, and there's no land there. No roads, no cars, no people. I honestly thought that I'd never get to come here. After 15 plus years as a professional photographer, I've seen a lot of changes. One of the biggest changes has been social media, specifically its effect on the creation and distribution of images. I now spend way more time in the digital world than I do behind an actual camera. I've come to Iceland to get away from it all, to get out of the studio and return to nature for a short time, to create something outside of my normal routine. What I'm not sure of yet is if this is motivated by a deeper meaning or if it's just to generate content for Instagram. How do you think Instagram has played a role in tourism here? I feel like photographers almost kind of led the first wave. I think it definitely did, but at the same time, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, everything was kind of popping up at the same time as Iceland was getting more and more famous, you can say. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is the tourism Everything is amazing. the biggest industry in Iceland now. Yeah. Uh, the fishing is number two. The fishing was number one before. Exactly. When the bank crisis happened, you know, then of course they were talking about it in the news all over the world. Iceland got hit hard in 2008. Here's world famous photographer Manny Ortiz in Los Angeles to explain. Say I want you to give me $100 so that I can buy a new lens. If I say I'll pay you $105 back in a month, you probably pass. But if I say I'll give you $150 back, we'd probably have a deal. This is what the Icelandic banks were doing, offering incredible interest rates to foreign investors that were completely unsustainable and spending all their money. Here's Irene in a hot tub to explain the rest. Now a month goes by and the land still hasn't generated any cash. I still owe you money, so I find another friend and make a deal to borrow money I owe you from them. Maybe I pay that $225 to borrow the $150, and next month I'll spend $300 to borrow that $225 from someone else. You can see why this is a bit of a problem. Borrowing more money to pay back old debt, creating a huge bubble that was ready to explode. When the bubble did pop, it had a surprising outcome. Yes, foreign investors lost their money, but it brought a lot of worldwide media attention to Iceland. Through social media, a lot of people were now seeing stock photos of Iceland for the first time ever. And because of the bank collapse, it was wildly inexpensive to travel here. And as they say, no press is bad press. That was 2008, but that was first after the eruption the, in Eyjafjallajökull, the volcano, 2010. And then it started. Architects design the plans of blue and black and gray. Then the 
I can clearly trace the lines and read you in that way Designing fact from flaw Tearing down the baseness of it all Alright, we've just arrived in Iceland and we've driven to our Airbnb and Tim came outside to check the, uh, we have a natural hot spring here and he's already seen Northern Lights and it is incredibly rare, one, to see them, two, for it to be clear um, in Iceland specifically and there's no wind, it's just absolutely beautiful out here. And I'm running five second exposures on this Nikon 24S and I'm just kind of taking some photos across the sky. This is also incredibly early, like what time is it? It's 6.45 right now. Yeah. And we're already getting this amazing light show over top of all the snow-capped mountains out here. I switched to the 14 to 30 f4 uh, because the high ISO of this Nikon Z6 is really good. Um, I don't I don't mind pushing the ISO a little bit. Another Northern Lights tip is that your initial reaction is to go for a longer shutter speed. So you want to go for like a 45 second or a 30 second shutter speed uh, to really just kind of get all the light in. But I've noticed that somewhere around like five to 10 seconds is kind of ideal because if you are running a 30 second shutter speed, the entire sky just kind of lights up green, which is the biggest positive problem ever to have. We came here with the intention to photograph northern lights and we didn't think that it could happen um, i've been here lots of times where we've been weathered out over and over again i've been lucky one evening um, but today look at this ridiculous all right so now we're getting out of the water and we're going to try to get some good reflections before the northern lights are gone so uh we haven't been down there yet it might be a bit of an adventure it's going to be a bit of an adventure here we go this week on Northern Lights Hunters. Dun, 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 dun. I've got one, I've got one! <laughs> Get the net! <laughs> so contrary to what I mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, I actually really want this shot specifically with really calm still water. So I'm going to increase my shutter speed something like Let's do 20 seconds, f4, 1000 ISO, turn on a little two second timer here, and let's see what that looks like. So the bank crisis and the erupting volcano, while not necessarily positive things, actually directed a lot of media attention on this small country. The photography community really took notice, and while landscape shots were guaranteed to win the admiration of your friends on the internet, photographing a wedding here could launch a six-figure business and transform your entire life. Weddings in Iceland would be published as fast as you could edit the images, and a byproduct of this was now that every single engaged 20-something was exposed to hundreds of beautiful photos of beautiful people in this beautiful country. Iceland was new and it seemed to be what all the cool kids were doing, which gave safety in the decision to come here rather than a traditional beach vacation. Iceland caught on to this and over this time, Iceland Air was essentially running a break-even operation just to ignite tourism in this country even more and make it incredibly reasonable to get here. Anyone want to go for a swim in water that should be frozen? Tim does. Okay, si no tienen algo... Okay guys, <laughs> welcome to Team Quarters National Park. My name is Luis. Uh, I'm gonna be your guide today. I am a Paddy Scuba instructor from Mexico. Now 
Iceland is a place that punches way above its weight class when it comes to its impact on the world. Less than 350,000 people live on this island, which is less than the city of Wichita, Kansas. Also, I'd like to take a moment here to voice my frustration that Kansas is pronounced Kansas, but Arkansas isn't pronounced Arkansas. In the past 10 years, Iceland has had a significant impact on photography as a whole. Coming to Iceland is kind of like a cheat code for photography. Remember what I said earlier about there being no shortcuts in photography? A lot of photographers are starting to view Iceland as a shortcut. That it's too easy that you just get here and get the exact same photo as everyone else. That there is no story, it's just a pretty thing. It's a check mark on your social media account, and that's what's wrong with photography, and that's what's wrong with society. I'll be honest, Iceland is pretty easy. You land at the airport, rent a car, and in 20 minutes you're at Blue Lagoon. Check. 10 minutes from there, you've entered an entirely different planet. Stand on the roof of your rental car for a photo. Check. The do it for the gram vibe is strong here. Do we come to Iceland because it's an easy level up to our status and our portfolio? A place to ratchet up to show the world that you're cooler than a beach vacation? Has Iceland become a place guaranteed to impress the people that you don't even care about on social media? Do we come here for all the wrong reasons? Have we ruined Iceland or is Iceland just a perfect mirror on our culture right now? A culture where we want the pretty photo in the easiest way possible, where we want a life that makes others jealous, even if it doesn't mean anything to us. Where public image is more important than private happiness, and where we all dream to be influencers, but no one will ever admit it out loud. Have we become a generation of Wi-Fi explorers? When you get here though, You'll forget all of that. Iceland is so far from anything you've ever seen. You feel different here, closer to Earth, inspired to explore, without a map, with no destination, to live and to get lost. To travel is to live in the unknown, to become more calm and level, to accept when things do not go as expected. It's where you'll get so lost that you'll actually find your true self. If photography is what inspires you to come here, that is only a good thing. A lot of people have a lot of opinions on places that they've never been. And as a person that has been to a lot of places, I'm telling you to come here. So come, swim in the Blue Lagoon, pet a horse, and do whatever else makes you happy. Oh, the episode's not over yet. Welcome to episode one of Cooking with Taylor. We are here in Iceland and a key part of Scandinavian cuisine in any country is using the local land and foraging for ingredients. Step one is to open your foraged ingredients. Find a knife. Now that you've found your knife, open the onion. Do we need to wash these? That's probably how you do that. So here we have the butter and uh, you just cut off, uh, I guess you're supposed to open it first. And you throw it in the pan. There we go. All right, now we're cooking with fire. Butter is starting to melt. So we might use too much butter. How you counter for that is you just add more salt. And then kind of like a child, you just look through the cupboards and you just see what you can find. That's too much. Essentially what you're doing here is you're making an onion reduction uh, through the butter here. And you're gonna cook it down kind of like a risotto and you're gonna get fried onions. All right, and there you have it. We have our onion, fried onion reduction. Uh, it is complete. We are ready to move on to phase two of this classic Icelandic dish. <laughs> Step two, you put the hot dog in the bun, which we foraged earlier. Traditionally, the Icelandic hot dog, you put the fried onions that we've made here through our onion reduction, uh, actually on the bottom of the bun. What we like to do is actually to put the onions kind of on top, mix it in with the sauces, and then rotate the dog. The Icelandic hot dog is a very special hot dog, and I'm happy that you joined us today. 
on the first and only in the last episode of Cooking with Taylor. <laughs> I find it really interesting that the place we go to return to nature was made popular by smartphones and social media. Just a short time ago, very few photographers had been to Iceland. It was not anyone's list, and now it's rare to go an afternoon without seeing an image from here. Like I said earlier, they really do punch above their weight class here. The entire country seems to have banded together to run tourism like a social media startup. It's lean, rapid growth at break-even rates to prove initial concept and hit a critical mass. Together, they've hit that critical mass and it's pivoted their entire economy. It's come at a perfect time as well, where we're all craving that break from technology, but that technology has leveled up our baseline to what is exciting and what feels like an adventure. My bigger question is that if our baseline continues to ratchet up, and this is the progression of tourism, what could possibly be next? What could be more internally and externally rewarding? Will we always come back here? Is Iceland now a permanent tourism landmark in our world? Or is it just a short-term fad? That's enough serious stuff, let's take some pretty photos of stars. Astrophotography, most of it is just kind of pre-planning. So I use an app called PhotoPills, and basically what it does is it gives you the AR version of kind of what's going on here which is augmented reality and you can see that kind of the big cluster uh, that you want to be photographing is kind of like right in this area uh, one of the big astro tips that i can also give is that you have to go somewhere where it's colder because there's less moisture in the air and less kind of obstruction before you actually get out to the stars so um, i'm also not an astrophotography master by any means these are just kind of my cole's notes i guess of taking good photos out here uh, i'm using the 24 millimeter 1.8 i like to get as wide of aperture as possible so if you can use 1.8 or 1.4 uh, you're going to be in better shape theoretically you could run a one or two minute experience exposure but the problem is that the world is moving and the stars are kind of staying in one spot so you're getting small little trails if you run too long with exposure uh, experiment to see what works for you but I find that somewhere around like 10 to 15 seconds usually leaves the stars nice and crisp right now what's happening is the uh, kind of the core of the image that I want to take is right here and there is some strange light out here pointing directly at it and I have no idea why that is or what's happening um, there's also northern lights happening out here. So my main tip is one, shoot at something like 1.8 or 1.4 if possible. Um, two, if you don't have a cable release, make just like a 10 second timer so that your camera just completely stabilizes before it actually trips the shutter. And I'm doing a 10 second exposure, F 1.8, ISO 2000 on this Nikon Z6 with the 24 millimeter 1.8 S and that's what it looks like. One more tip for photographing the stars is turn on manual focus. Uh, if you're running autofocus, it's gonna, it's gonna give you headaches. Basically what I do is I point at whatever light I can find. There's usually one light that's off in the distance uh, and I focus on infinity and go from there. We also made this light out of, uh, <laughs> out of a flashlight and a coffee filter with a chip clip. So what is the future of tourism in Iceland? It's wild to think that they're only really 10 years into being a travel destination. And in that time, they have stayed true to themselves, which is something I will always respect. They're not modeling themselves after anyone else. They are figuring out what works for them, failing and iterating forward on what works. With such rapid growth, there are bound to be some logistical and physical growing pains, but this country has a good heart and it will find its center through it all. As Iceland grows, it's only going to push tourism more north and more east. It's a big country to explore and the time to come here is now. No one has ever been upset they visited a country before there was a Starbucks. Come experience what Iceland is for yourself, not for a social media check mark. It is a place to recharge, a place to do less, and a place worth remembering not what you did, but how you felt. In those moments, create images that mean something to you and they will always bring you back here. Photography like life is a very long game. You learn the basics pretty quickly and if you're fortunate enough, spend the next 80 years figuring out the rest. Photography is not a race, there is no finish line. 
We're all just out here trying to make better work than yesterday. So make more work, iterate, learn, and advance. We're all just a misfit collection of introverts that never made the sports team trying to find our way. Good luck exploring the infinite abyss.